Hello, everyone, and welcome back to La Cancha. And today I'm with Taps and Oscar, and we saw the Super Copa. It was a beautiful game. And I want to start with the preamble to that game because we saw a very competitive semifinal. And I'm sure that any of us could have imagined it could have been a Betis Valencia sort of final. But at the end of it, it happened to be Real Madrid Barcelona at the end of the day. And going into this game, Oscar, did you expect Barcelona to be as dominant as? they were in the game? Um, I didn't think so because you know how I've complained that we only play well for 30 minutes and then we seed control. We did that against Atleti and we did that against Betis and we got away with it twice. I was thinking, you know, it might be a bit of a struggle today, but, you know, it turns out that they got, they got that system of half and half performances out of them. Yeah, and I'll talk to you regarding Barcelona's starting lineup because this was the starting lineup that worked. I remember that game against Atletico where it was yeah. uh, four it was four two and this was it was somewhat of the same lineup with mm -hmm. the young Busquets, Pedri and Gavi playing somewhere in the left in the left wing, Dembele on the right. And is that has that given more balance to Barcelona's midfield? Yeah, I think Depends on the opponent. I feel like against Atleti, the last match we did it because Lewandowski was suspended and we just need, and not all of the wingers won form. Today, I think we did it because Real Madrid play a similar way in big games, like having Valverde start out wide and then come in to help them in midfield. So I feel like we did that to like match up to them in some ways. Yeah, and definitely, and as the game grew on, we have to talk about Gabby first, because this guy's a sensation. At the age of 18, imagine um, scoring a goal against Real Madrid, giving two assists, like, fine, it is the Super Cup, but that's still impressive. I mean, he's supposedly not a good player. So <laughs> <laughs> it surprised me. <laughs> um, I can't lie. I, I mean, I, I don't want to gloat about anything, but Gabby, I will gloat for him, because... He needed that performance to shut some people up. <laughs> anyway, yeah. immaturity aside, yeah, it was a truly great performance from him in a different role, like you said. Yeah, and, and if this is him at 18, I can't imagine how it will be when he's 24, 25, when he matures fully into his role. Yeah. I feel like the Barcelona is a team that has a lot of old players and a lot of young players and no in-between, so... When those young players get to a good level, yeah, it will definitely be something good for us. Yeah, and, if, and like now we've spoken about midfield, like Pedro had a brilliant game, the defense still for Barcelona, that's been the key. And the thing is, I, I was discussing this with Taps before the game, and I was like, I remember when Ter Sturgeon was the kind of keeper that every single shot was a goal. Yeah, <laughs> you This remember. guy is on drugs right now. He's in God mode, as Tap said. Yeah, since his hairline came back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, this guy. No one that's made the power of a good haircut, guys. No. Yeah, first no. has been very good. And like you said, the defenders have been absolutely superb. Yeah, speaking of haircuts, Jules Kunde, he's been incredible since this turn of the year. Mm -hmm. And the fact that Arao is there, Christensen is fit. Is this a, a little bit too late for Barcelona, given that in that Inter game where they really needed all of yeah. them, that they were nowhere to be found? Honestly, that international break, I will <laughs> curse it until the day I leave the set. Like, that international break, we're in their Champions League hopes this season. Because, like you said, those three are really, really good this season. And it's a huge, and like, I'm huge, I mean, Leaps and bounds upgrade ahead of having PK there or Eric Garcia, yeah, or Alonso sometimes. Yeah, I'm I'm going to bring Taps in to discuss this from a Real Madrid perspective. And Taps, what do you think about Real Madrid performance so far this year? Because I know one might be tempted to say that it's just the Super Copa, it's not that important, but. We've seen them. We've seen a drop in performance from Real Madrid ever since. I think the Leipzig game, it went to the Rio game, and yeah, they weren't that right good. Before the World Cup, yeah. right before the World Cup, after the World Cup, it doesn't seem like things are getting better for Real Madrid. Yeah, I think from a Real Madrid perspective, the concern would be about how we're not creating as many chances as we were. 
um, like early on in the season, like we're struggling to get <laughs> to get goals right now out of open play. I think most of our goals are coming from just, you know, random penalties uh, that we're able to get in the box. So I think that would be the big concern or takeaway from this, because, again, um, it's not to play down the Super Cup, but I think the major concern would be our creativity and especially how we're now super reliant on Vinicius on the left. And yeah. I think it's actually adding extra pressure on him because now all we do is give Vinny the ball and hope he can beat two, three defenders and create a chance. And there's absolutely like nothing coming from our right side. So it's kind of making it easier for teams to defend us. If you're able to shut down Vinny, you know that Madrid is going to keep constantly coming to that left side over and over and over again. Yeah, and Vinny has been a player who's, um, I've, I'll say, like, he's also had off-the-field incidents with um, with what's going on in camps, like, with the racial abuse and with the, all sorts of abuse that's gone on to him. Do you think that's affected him? Because in the last couple of games, he hasn't been the Vinicius of old. I'll, I'll even say since the Derby, he hasn't been the same Vinicius. Now, I wouldn't say that off-field stuff has affected him because he's, he's kind of dealt with it gracefully. Um, as we always know, like, it's always a shame when we see, like, the organization's not, like, trying to stamp down and actually deal with the racist incidents. But I think Vinicius has, like, brushed most of that off. And I think the only problem that's now coming to sort of affect him, like I was saying, is probably that reliance. And he's looking a lot more rushed. And his decision-making is looking a little bit like the old Vinny where he's trying to rush into challenges and get shots off. He doesn't look as calm in the box as he was looking uh, earlier in the season. Yeah, definitely. And Valverde, too, his, his stats have gone off the ball. I remember earlier in the season with Valverde, every shot was either a goal or an assist. And now it seems to have calmed down by a lot. Yeah, Fede's dropped off massively. But I think today he had he had an okay game today. The people that concerned me today was mainly Kroos and Modric. Especially Kroos, was, that was a total 180 from <laughs> the Classical performance. Yeah. Like, he was man of the match in the last Classical. And this Classical, Pedri and Gavi were running rings around him. Yeah, it they definitely insane. were. And, and Kamavinga, too. Like he's, he's a player in a lot of this big games. He yeah. does something in the first half that gets him hooked. Yeah, unfortunately today I I disagree with that change from Carlo though because Kamavinga was actually like winning the most area jewels. He was actually our most influential midfielder in the first half. But I think because it's easier to sacrifice him than to sort of make the call to sacrifice Kroos and Modric early, it ends up being Kamavinga in this situation um, rather than pre previous times it was his fault because he'd get the early yellow card. And then, you know, he'd be always nipping into challenges. But today, I, I felt kind of bad for him because if I was Carlo, I actually would have kept Kamavinga on. I would have hooked Kroos and Modric, actually, at yeah. halftime for this one. Yeah. And I, I, like you said, the good thing from a Real Madrid perspective is this is just a super copper. And, but also defensively, one thing that I'll say with Real Madrid that I find strange is that they barely kept clean sheets this season. It's almost every game you see the Real Madrid conceding chances and Thibaut Courtois is still making save after save. Has the Rüdiger uh, sign-in been as vital as before, or do you feel that maybe Madrid need to sign a centre-back next summer to shore up that back line? Uh, I think the Rüdiger signing has been fine. For me, what's been worrying is more uh, Furlan Mendy and like the <laughs> communication between <laughs> the actual defence itself. So it's not like... Uh, personnel issues per se because the talent is there in the personnel but for some reason everyone is like having moments where they switch off especially uh, Mendy now teams know that Mendy and again we've always known this from Mendy that he's sort of panicky on the ball but he used to yeah. always somehow like do like a Zidane role and somehow get the ball out but nowadays anytime he gets caught in possession like today uh, I think it was Busquets who snuffed out that pass that he was making to to Kamavinga and just quickly intercepted it and completely yeah. broke down our attack that led to the, the Gavi goal. So I think we just need to figure out a good like defensive pairing because I think Alaba and Militao together are really good, but we have to figure out a way to sort of incorporate Rudiger into that, maybe making it a three yeah. and sacrificing Mendy in that. I'm not too sure. In some games, it makes sense. Um, but again, yeah, I am sort of concerned about Mendy's form. And I think you guys touched on this in the last podcast when you were mentioning uh, the rumors about Alfonso Davies and all sorts. So I think Madrid are in a position where they're sort of getting tempted to maybe cash in 
But for me, I think Mendy can be redeemed, but I wouldn't mind if we went in for a left back and a right back in this actual winter window. Yeah, I, I think that's been an area of weakness for Madrid for the last um, three, four years. Mendy came in, obviously, and the one thing about him is if it's a player I really like defensively. He's been solid. There was a, there was a record he had when he was around Madrid when he first came in that he, he never lost the game when he started. But yeah. this season, <laughs> we're starting to see teams figure him out more. Like you mentioned, he gave away a loose pass in this game last week against the Same, same against, against Villarreal, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you wonder whether it makes sense for Madrid to go for someone like, to bring back someone like Fran Garcia, who's doing really well at Rayo, to go for someone like Fresneda, who did very well against Vinicius, and a lot of clubs in Europe seem to want him. Yeah, for me, if I'm Madrid in this window, I would actually actively target a left back and a right back. But again, not in a way of like, condemning Mendy but sort of bringing in competition and then in the end if Mendy loses out it's whatever but ideally you want to bring in that competition because at the moment if he's starting to make defensive errors and then he's also not helping Vinicius in attack it's now you know becoming a bit pressure because especially in attack like Vinicius is always on his own he rarely gets those like overlapping runs where his fullback can draw a man or anything like that so now Vinny's having to take on like one or two defenders by himself yeah yeah, that's true. And for both of you guys, how do you think this result affects the tight race? Tight race is going to be tied between both teams. And both teams at the moment, they look like Barcelona definitely from this performance might look like they're back to their best. Like, do you, how do you see Real Madrid coming back from this? Because last season, Real Madrid had a similar drop in January, but it was Sevilla chasing them. And we all know what happens there for the rest of the year. This time it's a good Barcelona. So do you think that drop in January might be too much for Real Madrid, or do you, do you see Real Madrid retaining the title uh, tap? I think it'll be a bit tricky for us. It'll definitely hurt our confidence, uh, especially, like I was saying, the Villarreal game um, to then lose today. And the manner that we lost, especially, uh, I take my hats off to Pedri Gavi and Busi. They were phenomenal. And then I think going forward, uh, we have to deal with Villarreal again. Uh, in the Copa del Rey, we have Athletic Club at San Mames. Uh, we have Real Sociedad coming yeah. to the Bernabeu, Valencia coming to the Bernabeu. So I, I know we're going to drop a game and then, and the and within Cup. those results. Yeah, and, oh, I even forgot about the Club World Cup. <laughs> Add that on top. So it's going to be rough. This like little end to the month is going to be rough, and it's really going to hurt our confidence. But I think we've seen uh, Madrid. We know how to deal with mentally chasing and keeping up. And I think the only massive change that's going to happen is that this will fuel Barcelona a lot, especially given that they've struggled to have big results this season. Uh, Cause that's another criticism we've always had about Barcelona of how they're handling the big games, but now they're actually showing that they're able to stamp their authority and actually dominate a game. Cause don't get it confused. Like this result actually flatters Real Madrid. The scoreline could have been a lot worse if it was not for Thibaut in Nets. So I think Barcelona will be very, um, what's the English word for it? Like revitalized or energized. They're, yeah. they're going to take a lot from this, yeah. More yeah. than it'll hurt Madrid. Yeah, that that, that's, that's very true, especially after what we saw against Atletico and Barcelona. They didn't look at their best and they were lucky to get, come over three points. Like this should be what Barcelona needs to go in and get the job done in La Liga. Yeah, you'd say that, but then football, you know, things change very quickly. Like, we were talking after the last class about how how Real Madrid might run away with the league, and then we're now talking about this. So, it's just, it's up to the teams to, you know, just keep doing what they have to do. But, yeah, I don't think we can really draw too many conclusions about what will happen because, you know, Stranger things have happened in football. Yeah, definitely. Do Barcelona need a right back? I know that's a stupid question. I don't know. Yes, the answer. yes, we need a right back. <laughs> and we, we need Arnaud Martinez and Zubimendi. Anything else, I don't want. I just want those two. <laughs> yeah, not, not even Thierry Correa. <laughs> <laughs> He's one of the best right backs in La Liga. I'm just saying that. Yeah, yeah he, he's 
<laughs> he's he's good, but okay. Personally, I, and there's also I'm players, not too much of a fan of him. Like, I mean, he's good, but I don't think he's that good yet. Anyway. Okay. Oh, well, fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> but Arnau is different, you know. He has that interior about him that that <laughs> Dani Alves in him, you know. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll talk more about him when we get to the Sevilla game. But, uh, boys, we're done talking about this game. We can move on to La Liga business. Yes. Yes, yeah, so let's talk about the team that's on top after the big two. That's Real Sociedad. And this was a high-flying derby. I really, really enjoyed it. The atmosphere was brilliant. Uh, Real Sociedad, they came out right from the get-go. And I'll talk about Kubo because he has been on fire. I, I've... I've tipped my hat to him. I've been one of his biggest critics, but boy, I'm I'm converted to a fan right now. He's playing amazing. Same. I can't believe I'm seeing this. I used to be his biggest hater, but now <laughs> the Japanese Messi hype is fully on. <laughs> yeah, that, that goal, goal was really good. He I mean, the celebration was stupid, given that he could get a yellow card, but that goal, man. Yeah. Like, even for the goals we saw today, I feel yeah. like it was like, the best goal. Yeah, there were lots of great goals to get out. <laughs> there was also uh, Oslo. Oslo. Yeah, yeah, yeah Oslo. Oslo. Yeah. For now, Quado. Quado too. Almeria's goal was actually, the cross at least was very, very good. Yeah. Let, let's let's get back to Ralph Sociedad. And even, not just Kubo, but Sorla has been very good. Like, they lost Alexander Isak. And we know that Isak Slam, he's a great, he's a good player, but Last season wasn't as good as he was in 2021 season. And now Sorloth has scored more goals than Isak. He scored seven goals in 12 games. And what I like about this team is, despite the fact they keep on losing players to injuries, they've not used that as an excuse. They just keep on getting better and better, look, bringing up solutions. And you have to tip your hats out to Emmanuel Agosil because he's come in, like, and no one really rates him. Everyone is looking for that one opportunity where, like, Emmanuel is not good enough. Let's, we're also supposed to actually get rid of him, but... He keeps on making the team better and better. Yeah, he keeps getting results over and over. And especially to think that they lost uh, Sadiq at the beginning of the season. They lost uh, Oyarth about the injury and they're just getting on, like not complaining, not doing anything. Like you said, they're just getting on with everything. They're not, um, they're not like worrying about the people that they're missing. And Kubo and Sorloth have been able to just take everything in stride. And Bryce Mendes as well has been really good. Yeah, he's had a great season. And Oscar, you were about to say something? Uh, yeah, um, I feel that Silva is someone that deserves a lot of praise because Tad, you and I, we've often talked about how he's been disappointing since he came. But this season, he took that personally. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he did. Like, the work rate for the Kubo goal, the work rate to, like, collect that ball, to <laughs> give that pass. And, you know, that, that finished with something else. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, David Silva has been really good this season. We are not even talking about Marino and Zubimendi. Yet. No. That front six is probably the best front six in the league this season in terms of overall consistency. Yeah, it yeah, is. Easily. And, and the thing with Ross is that I feel their biggest weakness is their wing backs. Like, if they, if they had really solid wing backs, like if they had the type of wing backs that, let's say, I'll say even Atletico Madrid had or Valencia had, I feel they'll be a lot more closer to Madrid and Barca this season because every other part of their team is functioning so well at the moment. And it's it shows in this derby where in the first half, I felt they were so much better than Athletic Club. And Athletic didn't really give much. And that's why there's that big gap between them and Athletic right now. And yeah. them and the rest of the league at, at this point. Yeah, exactly. They're almost the league of their own now. <laughs> Yeah, um, but with Athletic, yeah, it's not really good for them. That they scored yesterday, and that was their first goal in three games. It kind of tells the story. Yeah, it tells the story. It's one win in the last five games, and taps. That's pretty good for Real Madrid because Real Madrid, Athletic, are Real Madrid's next opponents in La Liga. Yeah, that's good, but I was actually <laughs> talking to, to Oscar about this before. I think San Mames is always a tough trip, regardless the form that, you know, Athletic Club have going into it. Yeah. So what do we think of this roster that team? Do, do we think they are nailed on to get the Champions League? Or do we see a slip up coming? Because we roster that we always hype them up until November. <laughs> but yeah. luckily for them, yeah. they're not getting not many games in November because of the World Cup. 
Yeah. yeah, I think this season they're finally nailed for, for Champions League. I'd be very surprised if they didn't make top four. Thanks. Yeah. I feel given, like we've talked about how they're in a league of their own and all the other top four chases are largely inconsistent sometimes. So at this point, I'd be very shocked if they don't make top four. Yeah. I'll say with Athletic, though, let's speak about them because we were very hyped about them in, at the start of the season. They were doing really well. They were scoring lots of goals. But now it seems that the goals have dried up. <laughs> Do we know why it is that they are not scoring as many goals? Huh? I've noticed that in their past five or so games, Munayin hasn't been starting and Sunset has been moved further up to accommodate another defensive midfielder. So I feel... I feel that ne- Dani Garcia isn't having the best of seasons, so maybe Sunset could drop deeper to accommodate Munyain again. And Berenger could also come back into the side. Yeah. Gorzetta, to be fair to him, has done really well since coming in, but I feel maybe now is the time to drop him because as a player who came up from the second division, he's going to have his up and down periods. So I feel it's better to have your experience heads to get you out of this reference. Yeah, it's better to have that, especially now that other teams are circling around them, Rayo, Asasuna. So it might not be as easy for Athletic to get Europe's, their European spot as we thought a couple of weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Um, Taps, do you have anything to say about Athletic, about their form and how they've been doing so far? I think, yeah, their drop-off is a bit concerning, but I think they should still be able to just sneak sixth or end up in like seventh and i think that would be like an okay season for them but it has like dropped off from them being basically guaranteed for europe and i agree with oscar especially with uh uh guru how do i say his name again i always forget how to say his name guru or something like guru zeta guru zeta there we go yeah Mm -hmm. because he started off uh during the season he started off really hot and he sort of become inconsistent i think they need to yeah drop him off and keep like being um what's it called again basically just managing his minutes and not putting him in the cooker as the main uh main striker and then you could use players like Berenguer and make tactical changes that maybe Ernesto Valverde hasn't been like going for he's sort of just hoping that the team can play itself into form yeah which is very risky for coaches to do I also yeah. feel another team because the Gurzeta change right means Iniaki Williams goes to the right and I feel Nico Williams is much better on the right hand side because these last few games he's been playing on the left too so I feel getting him on that right hand side will be an automatic boost for them. Yeah, because when they were doing well that was the combination they had Nico on the right, Iniaki in the center and Berenguer at the left. Mm-hmm. I, I think the Barcelona game really sowed doubts into Ernesto Valverde because before that game, they were playing their own style. But after yeah. that game, the fact that it was so easy for Barcelona to score four goals against them, it sort of made Valverde more defensive. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. But hopefully they can get it back on track because they've really changed the way they've played. And it's, I mean, even though they lost, they're still entertained. So Yeah. Yeah, and the thing is, though is that it's not like it's... A mir- it will take a miracle for them to get into the Champions League spot because we know how the problems of Atletico Madrid, how they're struggling this season. And we saw that today. Although today I felt Atletico played well, I felt they created lots of chances. But the issue is the finishing is so poor. And you can say Fernando had a great game, but I also feel they didn't finish their chances off. And I'll say Almeria deserved that point. And towards the end, maybe they could have won it. Yeah. I feel this game, Atleti started well and then allowed Almeria back into it. And then, like you said, in the second half, Ferrante especially created so many chances that his teammates were just shooting straight at Fernando. Right? Yeah. The finishing for Atleti this season is what's really letting them down, in my opinion. Yeah. Can I say something about the difference between Atleti and Madrid and Barca? I'll say um, one major mm-hmm. difference is the football IQ that Atleti players have versus Madrid and Barca players. And the reason why I'm, I'm pointing this out is if you see the Condobia goal that gets disallowed, that's, that's a low IQ mistake, man. Yeah, yeah. That's... <laughs> the ball's going in, it's going to be a goal, and you try to get in. That's, that's poor football. Yeah, when I saw that, I'm like, there's no way Almeria not equalizing. <laughs> 
like like what do you think about Letty Taps because their season is such a circus. Yeah, I think it's very worrying for for Atleti fans and especially now with like the suspensions and injuries they're accumulating and it doesn't seem like their board is going to do anything to help Cholo. Uh, and then you have the Joao Felix drama <laughs> that went on as well. <laughs> like everything <laughs> that can go wrong is going wrong, but you still have players like Antoine Griezmann, you have uh, Angelito Correa, they're all still playing really well. So I think um, there's cause for concern with Atleti, but it's not um, like worrying to the point. But I do think that this season they're going to miss out on a Champions League spot. Yeah, because the, the, the oh. yeah, because the worry is, or Oscar, you're about the worry is for them is that if Betis goes on a run, and let's say they don't let any other players leave, like they could be in real trouble because Real Sociedad there's seven point gaps in themselves in Real Sociedad, which is huge, and. If Betis goes on a run, if um, Villarreal do really well, like it could be a real struggle for Atleti. And if they miss out on the Champions League, that's quasi disastrous for them. Yeah, I was saying well because I'm like, to be honest, the more games pass, the more you actually think they can actually miss on the top, out on the top for the first time on their trail. And yeah. it's not something you'd have thought about when they won the league two years ago. I have a question. Is it um, presumptuous of me to say that they can miss out on top seven altogether? Nah. No, 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 no. It's not that bad yet. <laughs> yeah, it's not, not that bad. No, I, I know it's not that bad, but we're yeah. close to 19 games of the season, right? Yeah. And we all know how tight the league is from... Like, it, it's it's a mini league, the relegation battle. It's also mm-hmm. another mini league for the race for Europe. And they're mm-hmm. two points away from Rio. They're two points away from, or one point away from Osuna. I know Osuna and Rayo, maybe they might not like keep that. They're, yeah, but, they're not going to be that consistent, yeah. But you can see a Villarreal putting something together, or you can see an Athletic putting something together, or Betis is putting something together, in my opinion. I think at most they just miss out on the Champions League, not on Europe altogether, because like you said, um, Osuna and Rayo might not be that consistent. Yeah, my thinking is the same. I think fifth or sixth is probably where they end up. Yeah, yeah, that, that's. I, I think that's that's a fair assessment. But it's only because of I don't trust the consistency of the other teams. Yeah, maybe yeah. if Athletic Club was still like properly fully firing, then that puts another challenger. But I think because Athletic Club are probably gonna finish at like seventh or eighth at best. Yeah, that eliminates a, a challenger from that race. Yeah, that's true. And Villarreal definitely adds more power to you guys' points because they failed to impress against uh, Celta. Celta, I felt they were really good in the, in the first 20 minutes of the game, the last 20 minutes of the game, they should have had two or three goals. Um, I don't know what Villarreal were doing. They seem to take the Barcelona playbook where they score and then they just relax yeah. and wait for Celta to score. <laughs> Yeah, Salta had so many chances in them. Like the late, I think it was like the last 20, 15 to 20 minutes of the game, they could have run away with that. Yeah, Callis Perez shoots a lot. That's something I took from this game. <laughs> yeah, from really strange angles too. <laughs> but it was good for Strand Larson because he's been under a lot of pressure. And um, Carlos Cavallo spoke after the game and he was like, this was our best performance of the season. And the one thing about Larson is that I knew he had lack of confidence. That's what he said. But I needed to put him on the bench just to take pressure off him. And that seemed to work. Yeah, because he comes on and scores his first league goal for Celta. And yeah. yeah, it's really important for his confidence. So let's hope he can kick on. Yeah, let's hope. There are, lot, there are lots of teams there down there at the bottom of the table that when I watch, and Celta Vigo is part of them, I, I watch them play and I'm like, this isn't a team that should be fighting for relegation. Yep. But yeah, Celta of... should be a lot higher than they are right now. Yeah. yeah. I feel so... we talked about how they're a bad, a bad transfer window is practically why they're kind of down there. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and especially with the Dennis Suarez situation, which I scratch my head every time I look at Celta player and I'm like, they really need Dennis. Like, can the president just let his ego down and let Dennis play? Because if Dennis plays, they're a much better team. Because mm-hmm. we saw them, we're seeing the impact that Bryce is having at Real Sociedad. They lost Bryce. Dennis is sort of an own goal. And this is a player who can really help Salta. 
Yeah. Well, it's January now, so maybe you can move him on and use the funds to get a replacement. Yeah, yeah, maybe they can, and we'll see. We'll see what happens with them. But we're gonna move on to Ryo Vallecano and Isinio. Man, he's he's on fire. Like he's always been. He's always been a good player, but this season he's taken his game to another level. He's the cult hero of the league. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! And when we Ryo, like we've mentioned that De- De Tomas is coming back, like. Where, where do you see is the limit for this team? Like you guys mentioned that, or we we already said that they might not finish in Europe. But is there a chance, like a small chance, because they have no Europe? They're playing really well. Like why not? Yeah, they have no cup too. Yeah, I mean, it depends on Raul de Tomas's form. If he produces the kind of numbers he produced at Espanyol without having a negative impact on the rest of the forward line, then of course they can get Europe. And do you guys feel maybe it's time for Rai to move on from Falcao? He's not at his best season. Uh, I wouldn't say move on, but maybe yeah, if they can, if his wages are actually taking up a big, a big part of their wage bill, then maybe they should push him on. But I think if he's able to stay like on a cheap, uh, a cheap wage, then you just keep him, I guess, as like a reserve. Yeah. And I'll, I'll talk about general trend in Spanish football because we see a lot of these like players who they're like, which is good for a lot of the smaller clubs because like they get to their mid twenties and all of a sudden they become like really good players, and no one is willing to take a risk on them because they're like, okay, they're close to that thirty market, and we know with soccer clubs they have that thing in their head. Once he's thirty, he's no longer a good player, so we're not going to risk on him. But like it's we're really seeing that with like Rayo with um. EC, we see that with Oselu, who I think is a fantastic striker, is coming to his own, and he should be playing for a much better club in Espanol, in my opinion. And what do you guys think of that trend? It's pretty interesting, but I feel if a player is on form now, is on form at the moment, you, you should just go for it and just, you know, if you're a better club, for example, if a better club than Rayo comes, the chances that EC will take his game to another level rather than dwindle with age, like people think will happen, are much higher, right? So yeah. I feel if someone, if you have a late bloomer, just take advantage of it, you know? Yeah, we also see that with Morales, right? Like a Villarreal, that could be the risk people don't want, really want to take, right, Taps? Yeah, that's actually a good example. I was gonna say <laughs> you can have you can have the extreme where someone comes in and does really well, or you could just have the case where a player comes in and ends up just being uh, like a non-factor. But I think, like Oscar was saying, at this point in time, like it's kind of like a risk worth taking for clubs because it's better to actually like take the risk and do something than to just not take action. Because that's something I've always been frustrated at at Leti for for not like taking players that are Simeone type players like on paper that are scattered out throughout La Liga, but they yeah. just refuse to take a risk on them. I don't know why. Yeah, we'll talk about three of those players when we get to the Atafi Espanol game, but let's, let's talk about Osasuna because they're a team that they've gone under the radar. Like they they suffered a bit of a dip in form close to close towards the World Cup, but they finally got that win. They're very close to the top four at the moment, but it's a very tight race, and we, we think that they're just going to finish mid-table. It's just going to be another successful season for them. Yeah. I feel this is not a discredit to us. As in, I feel like they're the modern the La Liga version of Stoke City between 2013 and 16, where, like, in terms of league position, they were very, very consistent. So, And Osasuna have never finished under 11th with Arasato, so I think... Definitely do top that by a lot this season. Yeah, they definitely will. And taps is the Mayor as the Murici effect gone for Mallorca? <laughs> I wouldn't say it's necessarily gone, but yeah, they need to actually start being a bit concerned uh, about his performances. But it's it's something that I don't think will necessarily bother them because I think they're in tenth or ninth right now. So I would say for Mallorca, they're on course where they want to be this season. So unless like their form drastically drops off, 
yeah. then they'll, they'll be fine with it. Yeah. yeah, if their form drastically drops off, they'll be into that relegation super battle where Girona leads the relegation uh, table <laughs> with 21 <laughs> points. And and this game was that. It was like, I know the word 6 pointer gets thrown a lot. And with this game, you can see why. Because if Sevilla had won, it would have been equal points with Girona. And now Girona is six points ahead of Sevilla. And Girona, they're close. They, they set a club record of seven La Liga games without defeats. And they've been playing really well. Like, what do you think about them, Oscar? That's what happens when you drop one Carlos. You don't lose games. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's some old goalkeepers in this league that have to let it go. <laughs> well, Carlos was one of them, and Gasaniga is unbeaten. And while he still can't keep a clean sheet, and Jorna can't defend to save their lives, Who's they can attack very well. So you were saying something, Tad. Like, like, that ain't no problem that he can't defend. We love it. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> every game during that play is very entertaining, honestly, because they play really well. You have, like, Anel, Miguel, Riquelme, um, Valerie off the bench, um, Via all doing well. And, of course, the best player in the league, according to Sofasco, <laughs> Alex <laughs> Garcia. Yeah, like, you love him. I don't know how this guy keeps getting above seven, but, <laughs> like, you see, at the end of at, I'm not an advocate for just using all these stats, but yeah. his first half performance, he has five key passes already. I'm like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. Like, Jorona don't make any sense, but I'm glad they don't make any sense because they're really good addition to the league. league. And Yanel Herrera, like, he comes off the bench and he scores the winner. He scored the goal that tied the game against Espanyol. Like, he's, he's a player I've always liked, but for mm-hmm. some reason, he's always been at this level for La Liga clubs. And I think I think playing against, like, we're talking about Sevilla, right? We're going to talk about mm-hmm. them soon. And he's a player that could be at that level, playing for a team like Sevilla or a team mm-hmm. higher up the table. Yeah, it's just those teams have, been, for some reason, those teams don't want to take that chance with him. I feel like the chance for Sevilla to come for him was after Granada's last season, where they got to the Europa League, because he was very good then. But then Espanol, at Espanol last year, it didn't really work out so well. And I feel his reputation took a hit. Yeah. But now it looks like he wants to repair that. Yeah, hopefully he gets the chance. And to, on Alex Garcia, he's linked to Barcelona. He's linked to Atletico Madrid. Um, do you feel that would be a good move for him? Because he has six months left on his contract. You know, I was just thinking about this yesterday. I'm like, I know we want our now, but... Alex Garcia is a Busquets replacement or understudy. I'm, I don't. I think that might be too big of a step, if I'm being honest. But he can definitely do it at a very high level. Yeah. I think he used to be in Man City's academy or something. So yeah. You can definitely, you can definitely see like he has the potential to do something really good. Yeah, if I'm Atleti, I I go for that deal actually. Uh, alongside bringing back uh, Riquelme and Samuel Lino and all some of their other loanies. Yeah, I think I think Atleti would easily do this deal. Yeah, uh, speaking of Atleti, do you think Sevilla's performance this season is one sign for Atleti? Because it just tells them, I feel they're one really bad summer away from being like Sevilla. Nah, there's no way. There is no way you drop off the way Sevilla. <laughs> you don't think so? Because that... From top four to sent. a relegation fight? <laughs> yeah, yeah last I mean, we saw that. It's happened to Schalke. Yeah. <laughs> Stranger things have happened, man. <laughs> it that, is. Yeah. I don't think it will happen in the next two or three years. But it can happen if you just, you know, bad, like bad management, like, you know, like the board that Atleti definitely could, like you guys have said, make better decisions. Oh, yeah, true. They're yeah. the champions of making bad decisions. Because yeah, the reason I'm saying this is last season, no one would have thought Sevilla would have been in this situation. And I feel Atleti are like, they're, they're in a similar path in that they're finding it difficult to win a lot of these like games against smaller teams that Sevilla had last season. And then Sevilla had a disastrous window where you can find you can sell just going to Diego Carlos, and that's a big hit. No one's denying that. But you bring in players who are not at the level, given the money you spent. You bring in Doberg, and he's out to half a nine. 
you bring in Yanazai and you might go to Valencia. And it just, it's a terrible transfer window. Honestly, Monchi has had a disaster class. And on top of that with Sevilla, like, there's a lot of things going on with the presidency, whether Del Nido might come in, might come mm-hmm. back or not. And Sao Paulo's job might be under pressure at the moment because it doesn't seem like Del Nido wants him. They might want to bring the border last. Like, it's, it's a case. But uh, uh, they definitely <laughs> got him. <laughs> you know, even if they, if they don't get relegated on the border, I mean, they're gone as a club. Like, the severe identity is dead. What's the bad take stretch? Yeah, like, Saps, make sense of this. This is this is beyond chaos. This is uh, It's a different level from chaos. Yeah, it's it. a completely new <laughs> level. And that's the thing. Like, no one would have predicted this because most of us thought, okay, a bad season for them would be like 10th, 10th or, you know, 11th or something like that. But to completely fall off and on the pitch, like Sao Paulo's performances haven't been convincing. The defense is just making constant mistakes. Like the second goal yeah. that they gave away to Girona was just playing out the back and easy interception. And then Herrera chips <laughs> chips the goalie. Like, I actually feel, I fear for Sevilla. I remember early on in the season, I was very optimistic before Lopetegui had even been fired. And but now I actually genuinely worry that they might get relegated. Even the first goal, like Stuani is just there without any pressure, and the three defenders are just in the line. I'm like, yeah. what are you doing? And then going forward, just the fact that he plays Rafa me for 19 minutes is a sack of the offense. <laughs> <laughs> like, so, like Sevilla so have no pace in attack. Like you have Oliver Torres trying to carry counter attacks on his own. They're just yeah, the point of tears watching it. But, but the issue, though, is that's not the fault of Jorge Sampaoli, in my opinion. That's yeah, Munchie's fault. That's Munchie's fault. Because there's no... Yeah, a lot record. of this is on Munchie's recruitment. And I think, yeah. again, like you mentioned, they actually are, like, it's a very good warning sign for Atleti because whilst Munchie was doing bad recruiting, a lot of people, like, turned a blind eye and they sort of kept thinking, you know, trust in Monchi. Yeah. It'll come yeah. good. It'll come good. <laughs> and then look at slowly <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because at the, at the start of the season, I was like, okay, Marcel, I heard good things about him, but you bring Marcel in and he has the same injury problems that the rest of the team has. Like, it's just it's just a chaos because, like, the doctors, they sat because of Lopetegui. They brought them back. The injuries are there. Tech Tito, no one has seen him this season. Marcel, he's even a signing. He only plays like three or four games and he goes to Kevin Goody. <laughs> and Takatito has an ACL injury, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I think he's gone. And that's the frustration because, again, there was actually so many good defenders in the league that you can go for. But for some reason, Monchi was just, you know, he wanted to try and unearth gems or find some low-cost option, which was super risky to do. Yeah, very risky. And... You spend forty five million on those two on Nianzu who's making error after error. Marcel who's not there, that's pretty bad. That's disastrous. And so probably keeps on saying he needs a striker that gets him twenty goals to get out of the situation. It's it's not looking good for them. It really isn't. The good news though is that they have Cadiff and Elche and it seems like anyone can beat Elche at the moment, so <laughs> they might get three points. <laughs> yeah. I feel so Elche won you severe income. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Now, uh, if they if they don't beat L three, it's time to pack it up. <laughs> I start to pay for life. Yeah, <laughs> against the other city, we. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'll, it'll be it'll be surreal to see a severe relegation because better some you see yeah. them get relegated. So yeah. it's... <laughs> Depor versus Sevilla in the second division next season. <laughs> I'll be oh, there no God. matter what. <laughs> look, look as far as I'll face in that <laughs> Yeah, like like we're laughing now, but like it's it, it's it's it'll be sad. It's a reality, yeah. That's the thing. It's a real possibility. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. The relegation about there's no sugar coating. It yeah, and, and they can't do anything ball. right. Like this is a big blow for La Liga because mm-hmm. if you look at the viewing figures, especially in Spain, like Sevilla, the fourth most watched team in Spain. Yeah, and losing them will be huge, and you lose like a team with. A lot of atmosphere with fans, like thirty thousand coming to the stadium all the time. Like this is this is this is not good for the league for them at all. But mm. hopefully, but the thing is, real value is sinking like a stone right now. <laughs> so if you if you were very optimistic, you'd say they 
drop more points than Sevilla between now and the end of the season. But it's just crazy what like Real Madrid and Sevilla are relegation rivals. Like, <laughs> yeah, like Cadiz. Like, reality. Yeah, Cadiz is a relegation six pointer as well. So <laughs> it is reality. Especially if they beat Elche tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I think they do. Uh, let's talk on Espanol versus Atafe, which was this was the game of glasses, man. Because dude, this game reminds me of I think it was Rayo Athletic Club early in the season, where every oh, goal yeah. was just fire. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I was really happy for Espanol because they were under severe pressure. And the thing though is, Espanol is a bit similar to Sevilla in that the sporting director and the management let the coach down for sure, mm-hmm. and. Um, Diego Martinez, we know him from his time at Girona. He was under pressure, but after this, I'm, I'm really happy for him. I think they're lucky to have a player like Joselu. Yeah, they are. Um, I think this is three or four goal games in a row scoring, 10 goals in the league this season, uh, assist as well today. You know, it's just, it, it's just they have to hope that they don't turn up like Alaves because he had similar numbers for them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the thing is that we called out for someone to join us and in scoring the goals, and it seems like Poado has taken it upon himself to do that with two goals and two games. Yeah, like he's, he's been a good act. And with Hetafe taps, like if they lose Anasu now, are they, are they done? Uh, I don't think they're, they're done. They're, they're fine. I think they're underwhelming to the transfer window that they had yeah. going into the beginning of the season. But I think the position they are in the league right now, they'll be fine because of everyone else struggling around them. <laughs> I don't I don't think they get dragged into <laughs> the relegation fight, yeah. even though they technically still are in part of this little, you know, relegation club. Yeah, and I'll just speak about you now because Atleti are interested in him. And when I look at the players that they've been interested in, they, there's been Boye, there's been Boy Iglesias. I feel now fits them perfectly because Hetafe, they play more similar to Atleti than most any other team in the league. And he's really doing well in that system. So you think he'll be able to translate it into Atleti's current system and will get better results than Morata. Yeah, on paper, this is again one of those deals where you think this is a Simeone player. So if I'm Atleti again, it's why not tempt Getafe? Yeah, why not? I feel that's, those were all the games for this season. and um, Not this season, obviously. This <laughs> uh, but like if we're taking a look at the table right now, we can see that it's a very tight race for relegation, very tight race for Europe. And we're also Sedad with a seven-point gap over Atleti and Villarreal and Real Betis were all joined together with 28 points. Osuna are there close. Atletic are eighth, Rayo are ninth, and still chasing European football. And while for Valencia, like we were speaking nice about them, but God, I look at this team and I get scared because four points away from Sevilla. Uh, not... They're the worst teams. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Valencia will be fine. Yeah. Valencia will be fine. No. Yeah, hopefully. Shall we move on to the rest of Europe, guys? Yeah. Yeah, yeah let's... Sure. Oh, you're about to say something, Taps? Oh, no, I was saying sure. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, and let's talk about Arsenal, right? Because, like, we're... none of us were believers for Arsenal, but, damn, they... If they're to do it, this is the season. Yeah. The... I was talking to my brothers about how this Premier League season reminds me of the 15-16 Leicester season where a lot of usual top four contenders or title contenders are absolutely having horrible seasons and then one somewhat unfancy team is just, you know, doing the work and putting themselves in a league of their own like Arsenal are doing now. Yeah, because you look at the rest of the Premier League table and it's it's a big battle for like from second downwards. Mm-hmm. But like as we as we see on the screen, like uh Jock Felix, he went to Chelsea, Chelsea are in crisis. I looked at the table and I was surprised to see Chelsea at tenth and Liverpool ninth, and I'm like, Fulham are six. That yeah. I feel that's the biggest surprise for me. <laughs> yeah, <I'm> like, <laughs> yeah. what the hell is going on? I'm surprised that with the way Brighton are slapping teams up and down, that they're not sixth. Yeah, with, with Liverpool taps, are you more confident for that tie? 
Um, not not necessarily. I think with Champions League, we can always separate league form. But I think both teams are sort of going through a rough patch. Uh, but as we always see, it's usually a, a con, you know a tightly contested game. But I think maybe Madrid, we will slightly be looking the better going into <laughs> that game. But only just marginally. <laughs> Can both of you make sense of Liverpool's transfer strategy? Because it seems like they keep on buying attackers when the midfield. Their midfield is the now, big the, issue. The thing is, the buying of attackers comes down to injuries to Jota and um, Diaz that are long term. Yeah. Otherwise, FSG wouldn't make any signings. <laughs> <laughs> These signings are completely out of necessity. Yeah. Because, yeah. I, yeah. Oh, no, yeah, you can go ahead. No, I was just about to transition, like, say, like, speaking of signings, Chelsea, like, mm-hmm. is FFP existence for them? No. <laughs> and their signings also don't make, they make less sense than Liverpool's. Yeah, because I, I think, I, I was reading somewhere, and it's like, and I look at the fact that they signed Mudrik, and what Chelsea is doing to get over FFP is that they're signing players into long-term contracts. Maybe Barcelona yeah. can take notes. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Tebas FFP, Tebe, Tebas FFP is not useless. <laughs> yeah. So it's like it lowers the amortization cost. Like, so with Modric is for nine years, which lowers the amortization cost to like 11 million per year versus, yeah. let's say, 20 million per right. year. Nine FFP. years? Yeah, nine years. I, that's nine years you can join the loan army easily. Because <laughs> <laughs> Chelsea are traditionally like signing players on big contracts just to loan them and see how they do. Yeah, and we, and we draw Felix though. It's like eleven million loan fee. He gets a red card in his first game, so that's two million already wasted on him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think for Chelsea though, they're not really going to worry about the financials because I think they have the money. So I'm not really worried about them in terms of breaking FFP rules. I just think they're wasting it. Like a lot of the buys they're making are just mm-hmm. unnecessary deals. Mm-hmm. And again, they're choosing not to address their midfield, but they're mm-hmm. just going to keep buying defenders and buying attackers. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> just leaving the midfield. Yeah. Like it's actually very telling that their best signing this summer was a loan for Denis Zakaria. I think <laughs> he's been like the best performing in terms of the incomings. In term, yeah. And then in terms of their best player, it's 39-year-old Thiago Silva. And then everyone else around the pitch is just meh. Yeah. Yeah. I feel Arsenal need Mudrick more than Chelsea did. So I don't know why Chelsea are making this sign just to possibly and most likely waste this boy's talent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll see. They've been aggrieved for a lot of talents recently. But let's move on to another profile of teams. This is in Italy. And I think Serie A, it's a similar profile to... The Premier League, because you have one team that's so far away, but you have that big race between second and seventh. Uh, and Napoli is that team, and they made Juve disappear, and they're back against uh, Juve disappear, and they continue to march towards Serie A title. Taps, yeah. as our resident Serie A expert. <laughs> 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 what do you make of Napoli? I'm actually really loving them this season, and I finally, I can actually finally come on here and be confident, because I know previously earlier in the season... I was skeptical of them the same way that I was skeptical about Arsenal. I was like, you know what? They're a good team. They're playing beautiful football. But there's always that but that when the, when the pressure comes, are they going to be able to keep getting results? And so far, uh, Spalletti has answered every single question that they've been asked. And I think I could comfortably say Napoli and Real Sociedad are probably the two best playing teams in Europe right now, at least from what I've seen. Yeah. And I think there's actually nothing that's going to stop uh, Napoli from going to the title. I yeah. think pretty much like with Arsenal, I think their fate is fully in their own hands. Like only a sensational collapse will stop them from. I love this. Napoli and Arsenal are known for sensational collapse. <laughs> yeah, it's it's the yeah. two teams that are known for joy. Yeah, like, they're like... in good positions. Like coming into this game, I was a bit scared for Napoli because I felt maybe that collapse was just about to come because they lose against Inter Milan to yeah. start to return to Serie A. Then they had that game against Sampdoria, which was a bit nervy for it them. Was they got over, they got over Very the line. Shaky for them. Yeah, and especially Juve coming into the game as well. Juve had eight clean sheets on the bounce. They were just getting result after result. And going into halftime, especially after Di Maria hit the post and then Di Maria got the little nutmeg and goal, 
it actually looked like Juve was going to, you know, sneak a 2-1 or something like that. But Napoli was just able to switch gears and uh, get the result over line. That second half was really good. I think uh, uh, Kvaratskhelia and Oshimen will get the plaudits, but I think Rahmani and uh, Zambo and Gisa were really good in this game. Yeah, and the thing about this Napoli side is a lot of teams, I know a lot of teams lose big players. Like we spoke about Sevilla, we lost Kundi and Diego Carlos, and they yeah. just collapsed. But Napoli, they've lost, um, they lost Koulibaly, they lost Mertens, they lost Insignia. Yeah, lost Insignia yeah. And they've gone from strength to strength. And it's just, it's what I like about teams like them. And we also see that you mentioned is that the recruitment was on point and they have yeah. a way that they're going. Yeah, this is one of the craziest things about the Napoli season is that they're doing this in what's effectively a transition year. If yeah. you go back to the beginning of the season, I think probably unanimously everyone had them either finishing fourth or fifth because we were, we were like, no way <laughs> that Napoli are going to improve. But Spalletti has just every single question that's been asked, he's answered. If they don't make it far in the Champions League, would that be a failure for them? Uh, I wouldn't call it a failure. If, I, if, I'm, if I'm Napoli right now, I'm putting my eggs in the, in the Serie A basket. Yeah. They shouldn't, like, of course, it's not saying don't go for the Champions League, but it's more so saying, eh, if you lose in the Champions League, it's whatever. Focus yeah. on the league, yeah. Yeah, because I, I, I think in their history, even when they had Diego Maradona, they have not made it to the quarterfinals of the Champions League. And now they have Eintracht Frankfurt. Not to disrespect Eintracht Frankfurt, or we know the ghost of Eintracht from Oscar's <laughs> history. <laughs> Honestly, I, I saw another ghost that's in my head now, but I'll get to in a minute. <laughs> yeah. But, like, they should get by them. And it, it is a pretty open field. It's a more open field this year than previous years for Napoli. Yeah, Napoli is going to be very dangerous. No one's going to want to draw them in the Champions League. And especially Meret as well has been playing well. He's normally been a weakness for them. Uh, like, they never really had a reassured goalkeeper. But, yeah, I think no one's really going to want to draw Napoli if they're able to get past uh, Frankfurt. Yeah. Yeah, and non Serie A, Atalanta again, they scored ten, uh, eight goals in a 10 goal, ten goal game. Eight yeah, eight. that's the ghost. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it a ghost? Eight two. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, yeah. You didn't realize. Yeah. <laughs> no, I was, like, I saw your PowerPoint, I'm like, okay, I know Atl- Atalanta scored five by the last time I looked at the game, so I ended and I was like, Damn. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, we thought we thought the the goals for them were dried up, and all of a sudden they just bring up an eight two out of nowhere. Start batting at his finest. <laughs> yeah, it was a very good result for them. I think Scalvini was very good. Lukman has been good this season, and I think Atalanta needed that because they've sort of dropped off. Um, I think I would have expected them to stay in the top four this season, but I think they may be just finishing at European spot and they'll take it. True, but you would have to assume that a result like that has an impact on Juventus, like a big impact on them. And Atalanta, um, I think they're mm-hmm. a couple of points away from Juve or like uh, three. The same po- three points away from them? Yeah, mm-hmm. three behind Juve. Yeah, and you think that they, they and they're should... tied with the Roma, I think, yeah. Yeah, they Roma should have it. Yeah. Oh, perfect. They should have it within them to try to catch Juventus who might be the weakest link in the top four in Serie at the moment. Yeah, where Juventus are right now is, again, not to, to have a slight on Allegri, but I think he has them overperforming. Their position doesn't really tell their, their performances this season. But it's just been the fact that the Milan clubs have also dropped off uh, into shaking. Lazio has been good. Uh, Roma's been shaky. Udinese was good at the beginning of the season, but they've just they've done a real Sociedad and <laughs> yeah. completely down. Um, uh, so I think, yeah, Atalanta should be in position to challenge for a Champions League spot. It's just that I don't see Juve and Inter dropping out. That's the um, problem. Yeah. yeah, Normally, I would say Juve drop out, but I don't see them dropping out. True. Like, we'll hope for football's sake that Juve don't make it. <laughs> yeah, Juve actually have Atalanta next week. So. Oh, interesting. Yeah. That'll, that'll, be fun. that'll be fun to keep an eye out for. Uh, let's move on to League 1, where our boy, I, I think he credits our boy Benyeda, because we 
And I felt it was important to include this there because you look at the problem Sevilla is having in front of goal. And Sevilla's then Sevilla's worst <laughs> sale in their history was letting go of Vinny. Honestly, they didn't need to let him go. That was the thing. It, it, it's <sighs> like I, I felt like in the first season, they maybe it was it looked like the right decision because they improved as a team. And it's just like you just see it now. You see with the strikers that they've come in with, like. And the money that is spent on those strikers, like twenty million, yeah, million Ronnie Lopez, twenty five million, and Ronnie <laughs> Lopez, uh, fifteen on Rafa Mir. They spend money on Chicharito. They spend money on Jonas Devor. I just oh, wondered God. whether it would have made sense just to keep Benyera and continued. <laughs> when you look at it this way, but like just seeing this is like it, yeah. it's sad. Well, yeah, I think fair, the may have gone at some point. It, it, like, it might have, but I feel Benyera is the type of striker that. He feels a uh, sort of passion for a certain team hmm. and wouldn't want to leave. Because yeah. you could argue that he could play at a much better team than Monaco, because it's not like Monaco or Giants of European football, right? Hmm. But it, it's, yeah. it's sad. <laughs> I think in another universe, Sevilla keep Ben Yedda and they actually have a better chance at sneaking a title. Yeah. In my opinion. Like, especially when they pushed us with Lopetegui, if you swap out Ben Yedda into that season. Yeah. Maybe even, they do an Atleti. Even the 2021 season, I feel that was like the one year where they had that chance to win it, but they didn't have that firepower at the end. Yeah, they didn't They didn't go all in. Like, they saw the opportunity, and then they just like, eh, we'll try to wrap it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They didn't want to take that risk. True, true. But let, let's speak about the current state of Liga because PSG, they lost to Iran, their second loss of the season in Liga. And it means Lens are getting closer to them. Marseille as well. Like we have to speak about the, this Lens story because it's one of the beautiful stories of European football. A couple of years ago, they got relegated. They were in trouble. Atletico Madrid bought them for one year. They sold them, and they got back to Ligue 1 in 2020. And now they're second, and their net spend is virtually non-existent. And we, we could see the same in the Champions League. And it's a story that's slept on by most people. Yeah, uh, yeah, definitely. Them getting to the Champions League would be very good, but I don't think they'll. If they win the gun, that would be great. But, <laughs> you know, I don't think it will happen because PSG are just playing a different financial game to everyone else there. Yeah, yeah they are. I but... think they'll do well, but I worry that they'll get torn apart, like we saw that Monaco side. Or a little get torn yeah. apart, yeah. yeah. Or even Leon. <laughs> like I, I look at Ligon and I. And Leon, they're a team that they're always like in the top six, top seven, and they're, they're right now they're mid table. It's crazy. Yeah, the table Leon right had now. a recently good, tra- a decent enough transfer window, so I'm surprised they're not doing too well. Yeah. <laughs> nah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't rate their transfer window. I think there was a lot of just. <laughs> I mean, they brought back some hopeful players. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. bringing back like you said. Way, put it that way. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a lot of like, oh, if this works, kind of. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Can they can they run it back? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I feel that's been an issue with a lot of teams. Like the transfer window has been a lot of opium at the moment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and with even Leon, they have a former guy who used to like Toka Kambi, who we know very well from his time in Villarreal, and I'm just like, I, I just look at him, just like, damn, like, like Lali got some like top top players back in. The day. Yeah, yeah, we've we've let go of so many players for nothing. It's and, and, and it's been badly replacement. Yeah, even now, uh, Bet is losing Alex Moreno. Uh, I don't expect they, them to. Be. They bought a left back today, actually. Yeah, from Brazil. Oh, did they bring one? Yeah, yeah. Abe Vinicius. Apparently, I, I I don't know who that guy is. So I'm yeah, I've never it. heard of him. Yeah. But it's another case that's just like, let's see what happens. <laughs> it could go bad. Yeah, it's cool. like you're not bringing in like a, a guaranteed replacement. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Mm. It can't be worse than Hatafi's left back replacement. <laughs> 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 Yeah, even even speaking of Napoli, like there was like Lobotka was there from Celta Vigo, who no team seemed to want, and he's doing really yeah. well in Napoli. I think Oliveira would have made sense for a team like Atletico, would have made sense for a team like Sevilla, but he was like oh for very cheap as well. So it's it's a lot of like players are going for peanuts in La Liga, which is I'll say it's good for La Liga teams because they can buy them for peanuts and, and yeah. play their own transfer window. But it's also sad to see like a player lead the league for fourteen million 
when yeah, you see. Yeah, because there's no like real gain. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's kind of just like a sale. He gets a higher salary, and then yeah. the La Liga club struggles to find a replacement. Usually, going for like a low cost option that ends up yeah. not doing well, then they stumble upon the correct option afterwards. Yeah, like the only thing from Alex Moreno's perspective is I just feel <laughs> is that at this, I feel maybe it was the right time for Betsy Salon because going one or two years, like maybe there might not be that market for him because of his age. Yeah, <laughs> true. But I think you just wait until the winter if I'm them. But yeah, until that's yeah, preference. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's true. And I guess the final thing on our agenda is the Lisbon Derby, which was Benfica to Sporting two. And I just want to speak about Benfica because. Uh, they looked on fire before the break, and now I think they're one of those teams where the World Cup break is affected negatively. And all of a sudden, they're in a tighter race when it was a Warner's race in Portugal. And how do you think that affects them in the Champions League? Because I was very hot on them, but now I'm not so hot on them. They're doing well. Who do they have again? Sorry. Uh, I'm not too interested in the Champions League understand it. Uh, uh, Yeah, yeah. Come on. It it is the Champions League. There's some some interesting stories there. Uh, They have have Brugge, who's there, who's another uh, team that surprised the Yeah, is it Brugge they're playing against? Yeah, it's Brugge they're playing against. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Nice. nice. I'm excited again. (laughs) (laughs) Until we have another English final. Yeah. (laughs) Or worse. Uh, Number 15. (laughs) <laughs> I, I think I think Benfica will actually be a problem for people this season. I see them sort of like in a position with like Napoli where they're not really going to put all their eggs in the Champions League basket, but they're going to catch a lot of teams, mm-hmm. uh, especially a lot of the big sides that tend to underestimate these kind of opponents. Um, so I think one of them will turn out to be, you know, the Ajax or, you know, there's always one team every season that breaks into that final four. Yeah. I think it's either going to be Napoli or Benfica in there. Yeah, I, 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 hope, I would hope to see a Benfica versus Napoli last 16. And yeah. um, I'll say one thing about those two clubs, again, it's like fair play to them. They don't sell their players for peanuts. Like we just mentioned about how um, La Liga Maximum profit. Sold- maximum, <laughs> yeah. Because even with Enzo Fernandez, they're like with Chelsea, they were, they were very strict. They were like, give us our payment up front or you don't get it. And I think that's good yeah. for them. The only La Liga clubs that really sell for max profits are the two Bas Bas clubs. Yeah, so that's why. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's why my Zimendi <laughs> dream is on Parkwood right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, unless Barca win their losses game against La Liga and they're all of a sudden they have ninety million to spend for. <laughs> yeah. it's just crazy to hear Laporta say, "Oh." Uh, we don't compete on on equal terms with the rest of the league, and I'm like, dude, you spent 200 million, like, calm yeah, down. no, he's but, he's one. Well, of that's 200. <laughs> yeah, close to that, but like, calm down, calm down, like, you you can't complain. Yeah, yeah I, I told you, any any time complain at this point. <laughs> yeah, any time Madrid and Barca complain, it's always nothing. Like, yeah. I'm, I'm always really? just ashamed. I'm like, look at the rest of the league, the audacity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just it's, it's those rich people problems essentially. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's like, oh, we need ninety million more, and I'm like, you're you're going to waste the money. Like you're you wasted it in the summer, low key. You're going to waste it again. So, <laughs> but oh, well, like yeah. So it'll be it should be interesting what happens with the rest of the season in La Liga and the Champions League. I'm I'm super excited for the Champions League. And the Europa League. And the Europa League too, yeah. <laughs> that, that's what, that's what, uh, that's what, it's a superior competition. Yeah, yeah, La Liga plays on Thursday. Man. So that's what, <laughs> that's what I'm most yeah. I think what, there's yeah, three points separating League on, three points separating La Liga, four points in Bundesliga, and then yeah. Premier League and Serie A. Can we not mention the Bundesliga respectfully? Yeah. <laughs> well, mostly, they, they start on Friday, and it's going to be Leipzig versus Bayern. So, yeah. Cool. What was John Leipzig in? I, I don't know. I think they're like. I have to check. Yeah. If they're second, that four points is becoming seven. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. Mm. Be, be more respectful, Oscar. <laughs> it's not nice. I'm not calling it a farmers again. I'm calling it a league where one team is just. Yeah, like, like Leipzig, are, no. Leipzig are six points behind Bayern. Uh, Freiburg, surprisingly, are second. Frankfurt are in top. Yeah, yeah, Freiburg. Freiburg is a good story that we've been talking about. Yeah. Yeah. If they can get top four, that'll be awesome to see. Yeah, yeah I, I, Dortmund will be glad to get uh, Sebastian Aller back as well. So yeah, that, yeah. that's also yeah, he's that back. Hopefully, help their attack. Yeah. 
Sure. I have a question for you guys, and and this is just random. Who is having the worst season? Let's say let's take Sevilla out of the mix because we know they're having a total disaster. <laughs> yeah, but out of the teams that we had high expectations for, there's Chelsea, there's Liverpool, there's Atletico, there's Dortmund. Which one we say is having the worst season out of all of those teams? Mm. Oh, sorry, Dan. Let me scan the tables because yeah, Sevilla is the automatic. <laughs> so Sevilla is the automatic. <laughs> I think Chelsea would be up there. Uh, I think Dortmund is up there. I don't think Dortmund is as bad as the two English ones. Cause... No, True. You would say that, I, Dortmund, but... I think I worry because the defensive reinforcements were so good and then it just didn't work. Yeah. You say that, but, but Dortmund is again... three points behind eight and or three points ahead of eight, and with, which is Gladbach. So within one result, it totally changed. <laughs> the thing is that, with all due respect to Dortmund, it is a Dortmund thing to do sometimes. <laughs> True. Sure. I mean, I know it's hard to say respect, but sometimes you have to say the truth. <laughs> Very true. But I think Dortmund, 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 you hope that they, you know, take advantage of Lewandowski leaving, but. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, Haller and everything. <laughs> But still, the defensive, you know, stuff wasn't really hasn't really paid off yet. Yeah, and to be fair to Dortmund, they did lose Erling Haaland, who were like everyone already knew he was a superstar and he was like good scorer, yeah. a buttload of goals. But now people who thought it was easy for him to do in Germany are seeing that he's just a robot. Like he yeah. just scores lots but of goals. He's, he's actually not scored in four league games, so maybe they're finding yeah. him out finally, <laughs> <laughs> or he's just going through a natural dip. Sure. And Dortmund, they were good in the Champions League, we have to give them. but they did have a group of Sevilla and a team that allowed Sevilla to beat them, so... Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I think maybe I nominate Leon and yeah, Getafe. Leon. Yeah, Getafe. Leon. Leon and Getafe. Oh, yeah. I Leon. feel like Getafe's transfer business was so hyped up only for yeah, exactly. them to be okay. Yeah, yeah but boy, look at the forward line with Getafe. I remember that the goal they scored against Mallorca, and I'm like, why, does, why isn't this team higher up the table? <laughs> <laughs> Like, they should be where Mallorca and Osuna, or Osuna, in my opinion. Yeah, I predict yeah, that the top should finish, be like, ninth. Yeah. <laughs> what an idiot. <laughs> yeah, trust me, Oscar, we've made terrible predictions. Oh, we, we've made some stinkers. Yeah, we, we have. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we're in the anti Cooper and Silver fan club. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, we, I mean, we're, we're humble enough to know we're wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, my Villarreal top three prediction and Athletic Club top five prediction have taken some hits recently. Uh, no, nah, but that was good though. Yeah. I feel like that Villarreal is still on course. Athletic Club might miss out, but that's because we no one accounted for Real Sociedad actually staying consistent. Yeah, I, I said Real Sociedad <laughs> yeah. drop out of the top seven. Entirely. That's, that's the yeah. I, I thought um, that was I mean, it's a fair. The same thing with Napoli. Like those two teams had to. They were both making lots of changes yeah. this summer. Yeah. And, and with Ross is that I don't think any of us expected the impact of Bryce, of Kubo to be so mm-hmm. big. Like like Bryce I've always thought was a very good player, but this year yeah. it's taken its level to another stratosphere. It's it yeah. still puzzles me that Bryce didn't go to the World Cup. And, and I just don't understand. Yeah. yeah, me neither. I was like him and Marina should have gone on for him. Yeah. <laughs> Not Koke who is getting benched by a kid now. <laughs> <laughs> that, it's actually sad to see Koke like this. Yo, it's Koke, Koke and Saul, man. <laughs> like, Who's Saul? Is Saul even still <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know. Yeah, yeah. Saul is basically a hazard at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just miss the people. I hope they don't watch this part. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, but that thing, though, it's like the fact that Cholo is benching Koke and Saul shows you how bad the situation is. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah, yeah, there's no time for loyalty yeah. anymore. Because <laughs> before, no matter how stinky like Koke was, he would always be on the starting lineup, but now he has to earn it. <laughs> yeah, she has to earn it. Yeah. yeah. Huh? Well, I, I guess we, we need to stop roasting players at this point and, <laughs> and call it a <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we roasted ourselves too, so. Yeah. Fair game. Fair game. The, the strays are for everyone. Yeah. <laughs> except the viewers. Yeah, except the viewers. Like, thank, thank you again, Taps, for coming in. Hopefully, the next time you come in, it might be good news. Uh, 
Maybe Real Madrid are in the sixth no, winning trade. Never. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and it's always a pleasure to come. Yeah, yeah it's a pleasure to have you. Yeah. Especially when your team loses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now today today is actually the first the first post classico I've come to with a loss. Yeah. Every oh, other so, yeah. Four nil. Oh yeah, the four but but uh, No, four nil I didn't come to to I don't think I came to the podcast after the yeah. four nil. Yeah, but but the four nil was different. Like this one. Yeah, the four nil was different. It wasn't that big of it. Yeah. Like, except to best in the fans. Yeah. <laughs> I think at that point, we're already like, okay, Madrid is one, but it's, it's like, yeah. But yeah, hopefully, hopefully the league turns out to be as interesting as it is and teams continue falling over each other because it gives us something to talk about at least. And yeah. We Pray ourselves. for Sevilla. <laughs> apart, apart from Sevilla, I, I, I'm honestly like, hard on sleeve. I, I really want them to be in the league because they're, they make the league so much better. I'm not gonna lie, it'll be a big hit. I still can't believe we're talking about them. I know, man. I know. <laughs> no, it's a shame, but oh well, we'll see what happens in the Circus of Sevilla next next week and Circus of Atletico Madrid, Circus of Borussia Dortmund. You know where it's come for all that. Come to a Circus of Chelsea and Liverpool. Circus of Chelsea and Liverpool. <laughs> well, and oh, yeah, and, 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 oh, I don't like it. It's Tottenham. Tottenham have City next. Yeah, but it, it's, it's Tottenham. Oh, it's, true, it's, true, it's, true. It's it's true. not it's not a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> That's a distinct no. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We're, we're gonna get a bunch of hate mail, guys. So we're just gonna end it now. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm. And if you, we mention your clubs, we're just mentioning them in chess. We make fun of every team. No press is bad. <laughs> <No press back. laughs> yeah. Adios, everyone. Bye. Adios.